Hello and welcome to Decoding the Guru's review of Tom Holland's Dominion edition. Yeah, basically you and I read the book and just like another book we read, what's it called? Immune? Immune, we yeah. We want to talk about it. And we're going to read more books, fair warning. Yeah. And talk about them too. That's right. You'll never <laughs> stop us from reading books. And this one was related to Guru specifically because part of our motivation to read this book was that we both listened to the Rest is History series on Martin Luther and Tom Holland and the other one on <laughs> the Rest is History made specific parallels between Martin Luther and Jordan Peterson and kind of the intellectual dark web renegades of people presenting themselves as, you know, controversial figures going against the green. That was interesting. There was also parallels drawn to Trump and that secularism and humanism in the West owes a lot to the Reformation period and the kind of shift to an internal focus of faith being about what you believe as opposed to what you do and this being an interesting concept because a bit of a challenge for atheist secular types that actually your ideology is very tied into a particular religious perspective and you know maybe you're not as secular as you like to believe so i find that appealing discovered he'd written a book that was about that but more generally about the role of christianity and kind of history and western society in general so I thought this would be a good chance to hear an extended version of that argument hear other things and look at some of the broader arguments he wants to present about the importance of christianity in the west that's right you found it appealing you suggested we read it i did read it and finished it months ago you months were a fair <laughs> bit <laughs> slower than me well, well maybe eight, a month a month, uh, <laughs> eight months. yeah so, like, so yeah. my memory of the book could be a little bit hazier than yours but that's just because you're slack and i'm not um the, the other thing another little thing too little little post-it note we'll return to it is um another connection with jordan peterson is that tom holland might not be entirely dissimilar from jordan peterson himself yeah, we, we'll we get to that. I wouldn't have initially have drawn such strong parallels but in their discourse, but I, I do think there are significant ones there now. And I was vaguely aware that Tom Holland had a reputation for being something of an apologist for Christianity while himself not being entirely clear on, you know, the degree to which his personal devotion supply. I've always found that term an apologist quite quite funny because I always imagine somebody going around going, sorry. Oh, very sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Sorry. So, yeah. sorry about Christianity. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> That's not what it means though, Matt. It means essentially somebody who is offering a rather one-sided defensive account of a thing. And it's typically done by people who are believers in mm. a given tradition. You'll tend to find that many apologists who are not themselves invested in the tradition that they are an apologist for. So, but I will say when you said, I find the idea appealing about, you know, the potential religious roots of Western secularism. I'll just note, Chris, that I found it appealing for the same reason as you, which is that it was challenging. It wasn't something yeah. that I sort of instinctively kind of liked, but, you know, uh, at least at least at first glance, it it seems to have some truth to it. Yeah, and I think there is validity to that point about, you know, the peculiar emphasis placed on the personal assessment for the likelihood of various beliefs that this having tracing back to the Reformation and the focus in Protestantism about these kind of personal relationships and personal beliefs being more important than the particular ritual liturgies that you attend or this kind of thing. But as we discussed on the podcast on another occasion, there are plenty of traditions around the world where the practice aspect and the ritual performance still remains the mm -hmm. predominantly important thing. And this is the case in most of East Asian religions, just for example, or for praxic religions. Yeah. But before we get into the weeds, why don't we give just a bit of an overview of what the book is, what it's all about generally, and then we can talk about it so you do it i'll do you it do it. i'll do it i got some <laughs> notes in front of me why not so yeah 
uh, it's called Dominion, the making of the Western mind. And it's basically, the theme is about this, is the significant influence that Christianity has had on Western thought and culture. So the central thesis is basically that Christianity has shaped the Western world in all kinds of profound ways, even amongst people like you and I who are not Christian or religious. And the book is kind of structured in, it's got these three main parts. The first part is about antiquity. The second part is Christendom. And then the third part is basically about the modern world and the kind of legacy, I guess. So I think his main points, you could you could summarize them very briefly like this, that there are these Christian concepts which didn't really exist, according to Tom Holland so much, in the Western world before Christianity came along, like notions of human dignity. Universal notions yes. of human dignity. That's the crucial. Yes, point. everybody. Yes, right. Everyone has it. Compassion for the weak and the marginalized. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, these were kind of foreign notions to people like the Romans. They thought the weak and marginalized should be stomped on. So it... It made God the ultimate authority of these sorts of moral matters and, and so on. And he says that it kind of involved the separation of church and state, which isn't necessarily a thing in many other places. Again, with the Romans, right? The, the, the yeah. Roman emperors would often be a god, promote themselves to be a god. And they, you know, they, there wasn't really that sort of concept. So that's another one. And, and like you said, it sort of came to a head in the Reformation with Martin Luther and stuff, that emphasis on like the inner life of the individual, you know, rev personal revelation, struggling with your conscience, you know, having that sort of dialogue with God, that that, that kind of thing, very individualistic and, and cognitive, I guess, or inner spiritual is, is very important and sort of led to these sort of like Western focus on the self and your personal identity and the your own personal conscience and things like that. So the basic thesis is, is that even if you're not a Christian, even if you don't recognize where the roots of these ideas all come from, all of these things that we sort of identify in the modern, you know, Eurocentric kind of world are, are kind of fundamentally all springing from, arising from a Christian tradition. Yeah, and so that includes even explicit repudiations of Christianity. So if you're arguing for like a humanistic worldview or universal human rights and explicitly not making appeal to religious doctrines to justify it, it doesn't matter because the argument of Holland is that you can't escape the fact that that derives from Christian framing there's just there's no way out of it right that's the that's the soil from which it emerges so he finishes the book for example by pointing out about Dawkins tweeting something about liking church bells and highlighting that you know this this is the case that even you know a famed atheist who reels against religion osity and the mental virus that is religion or Christianity specifically ultimately was forged in a society that was strongly influenced by Christianity and they might not recognize it, but their values are fundamentally colored by that Christian environment, right? And yeah, <laughs> yeah, I have <laughs> thoughts. I, just one more thing on the structure of the book is to say that it's well written. He's a good writer and he's quite good at, you know, telling historical stories or narratives in an engaging way. But I think partly because of his interest in Rome and Roman history, the beginning is very, I mean, of course, you know, Roman history is important to the history of Christianity because of it becoming the official religion. But there's a lot of Roman stuff at the start, which <laughs> felt relatively Too incidental. Much for you, eh? <laughs> yeah, it was a good few chapters in, you were like, Okay, we're we're still <laughs> in in this period, and it, it sped up basically as it goes on. Like once you start to get into the you know the Middle Ages, the disparaging term for medieval era, and all this, then yeah, then then things move at a quick pace, and especially when you get to the modern period. But yeah, I just felt the the Roman 
period was dragging on. <laughs> yeah. There you go, everyone. So that's our review. In a nutshell, too much room. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's not... <laughs> One you star. had the same feedback, right? At the yeah, initially, no, yeah, no, it, yeah, it went on and on. Um, it's like like you said, it's well written, but it's written like I was quite surprised. I didn't expect to be reading that kind of book <laughs> yeah. because I've read a lot of history books. It wasn't like any one that I'd read because it's told in like a series of like anecdotes and, you know, here's the story and this is what happened. And as far as I know, they're all accurate or at least as far as historians know in terms of their details, but he kind of builds up evidence for his thesis via a long sequence of, of anecdotes essentially, right? Yeah, and the, there is some I concern, like I feel... He is probably accurately representing a lot of the historical cases. And of course, there will be disagreements, you know, between historians. There is no like single text of history. But I did find myself a little concerned when like he talked about people that I knew. Like just for example, he was talking about Tolkien at one point, And he essentially presented it as there is no debate about the fact that the Lord of the Rings is fundamentally a Christian work of art. And indeed, there is debate about that because Tolkien explicitly said, no, it wasn't. And then later he said, yes, it was, but various people have highlighted, you know, different letters and whatnot and the context of him wanting to sell things in a Christian environment. So it was kind of like the way he presented that just so forthrightly that like, of course, Tolkien, and he took the quote that all Christians use about him saying it's a fundamentally Catholic work or whatever. And I was like, I, I just knew that that presentation was too simplified. Yeah, yeah. So I went and checked and was like, no, it, yes, it is. So <laughs> yeah. that'd be maybe a yeah. little concerned. Like, did he do that yeah. with other figures? Yeah, to clarify, I meant more the sort of concrete details that he sort of cites in terms of this happened and that person said this, not not his spin on it, which I agree. <laughs> it, it tends to be a particular, a very specific interpretation. And I'm not a good enough historian to be able to critically appraise most of them, but I have read a few reviews where people said exactly that about some of the other, you know, yeah. the interpretation that, that that he gives them. Yeah, like they're they're obvious. I mean, you could draw parallels in stuff in Lord of the Rings to Christian narratives and whatever, but also there's just elves and trolls and wizards and whatnot, right? And then there were potential concerns about it being interpreted as a like you know a secular piece of art that Christians shouldn't be engaging with. So there's there's some issue about Tolkien having <laughs> well, all their yeah. concerns to present it as a Christian work of art. Yeah, like a lot of people interpret it as like an allegory for like the Second World War. And, yeah, um, and he said it's not. <laughs> he said it's not, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, when you read it, I mean, you can't help but suspect... <laughs> I mean, there are obvious there are obvious influences and whatnot. You can't always take offers that they, you know, know every detail about the things that influence them. But it's just the, the the meta comment is just presenting it that the Lord of the Rings is fundamentally a Christian work of art that could only be produced by you know a Christian mind suffused in Christian yeah. imagery. And you're like, well, okay. Yeah. I mean, I I feel that that's a very strong interpretation of what the evidence suggests and like a selective presentation of citing this this one part from a letter mm. that he wrote to a bishop mm. and not various other uh you know yeah. points mm. yeah but that's that's a good example actually because that is perhaps the issue with the entire book <laughs> right which yeah. is that which is that he he sees christianity kind of in everything and yeah. some of them he draws really long bows like for instance he he comments that like the the islamic state and it's let's politely call them excesses the excesses yeah. of the islamic state he he draws a direct parallel between that and the the protestant radicals in munster you know who also got up to a bunch of crazy shit basically and 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 had a kind of ultra fundamentalist rationale for them and you know that's a long bow to draw right that's a big gap in in space there's a lot of people that put people up on crosses or stick people on hooks and stuff throughout history that you know like in order to serve as a sign of their authority and also a warning to people you know not to cross them so yes and like you say the general issue it is not that there is an influence and a role of Christianity in almost all the events that he's talking about. It is true that, you know, the European history, to understand it without 
considering the role of churches and the various beliefs and, you know, conflicts between Catholics and Protestants and stuff, it doesn't make any sense. And it is also clear that there are components of, you know, the ethics and morality make, make reference to, you know, Christian themes and whatnot. All true, all true. But it's whether you take that as the primary monocausal force that is driving various factors in history. And that's what Tom Holland's strong thesis and the kind of part of the book that I think a lot of people take issue with is that he is almost always crediting Christianity as the most important cause. And it is somewhat selective. It is true that he talks about excesses and he talks about bad things and whatnot, but he's, it feels like he's much more ready to characterize the excesses of non-Christian and in particular secular movements, right? Like the, the Nazis as being motivated by like a kind of bastardization of science. Yeah, yeah ideology and and whatnot than he is with Christianity, where he will note that slaveholders make reference to the Bible to justify Mm. holding slaves. But it's it's quite clear in his presentation that he feels this is a less well-supported position than the anti-slavery people. Yeah, and he gives credit to Christianity for the anti-slavery movement, right? Because, you know, and, you know, you can easily guess what his arguments would be, right? The Christian ideas of the universality of human dignity and... And the Quakers opposition yeah. like early opposition to the movement and you know yeah. v- various religious leaders and civil rights movements and so on yep yeah and like he for instance he he says that you can identify in the, in the roots of marxism you yeah can, you can <laughs> yeah. see the the influence of christianity because the, because the marxist vision of a revolutionary overthrow of, pr- of oppression leading to a utopian egalitarian future that mirrors christian apocalyptic and millennial ideas as well as the idea of you know the meek inherited the earth and and all of that other stuff and like you can do that you can take (laughs) (laughs) you can take you can take marxist thinking you can take christianity and you can find the intersection of ideas that are in common and And point out that people were raised in lutheran households or they had you know a protestant or catholic upbringing and they referenced some biblical quote and speeches and blah 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 blah. that's right so i mean you know almost as an exercise for the listener think to yourself what might be the problems (laughs) with operating like this (laughs) right because because you you could do that and you could find almost like a conspiracy theorist right lots and lots and lots and lots of connections and I'm, i'm not saying that there isn't necessarily some kind of common dna because at least my default understanding of like the history of ideas really and culture which is pretty much what he's about is that it is always it's almost like a river right of all of these different little streams and tributaries things are cross-pollinating and influencing each other it's basically a great big mess but but there is naturally a lot of cross-pollination but my default assumption would be that it's very dangerous to pick out one little one thread in that river of ideas and say that is the instrumental causal common denominator so so that's my first critical thing and i would follow that up chris by saying that i think if you want to make an argument for a particular thing being instrumental or causal then you have Mm. to do more than what tom holland does which is to identify (laughs) things that sound similar you actually got to say okay well in what ways is this falsifiable? What things would undermine that idea? Well, if Christianity really was the key causal factor, then you wouldn't expect to see these ideas that we associate with Christianity before Christ came along, right? In the Western Near East type type world. Another thing is you shouldn't expect to see those sorts of ideas in other places in the world, which we know have had very little influence from Christianity, right? Yeah. Because if you do see those things, then clearly Christianity isn't needed as the ingredient to give to give rise to them. Would you agree? Yeah, this is the case. And I, I think also he, he spends a lot of time emphasizing that, that representing the Christ figure who was crucified and was a like a peasant figure, right? The iconography of Christianity focuses on 
a potential defeat in a way, like a humiliation, right? Uh, an execution. That this is revolutionary because of this message about like upturning the social order. That you're not worshiping an all conquering deity. You're worshiping a figure who was sacrificed, right? And give their life. And when we talked about this a little bit on the podcast, I mentioned the Jataka Teals, right? And the Buddha in his previous life sacrificing himself to a tigress and so on. But there are lots of figures, Matt, in world religions and mythology where figures suffer and they don't succeed, but they become immortalized as, you know, heroic figures, in part because of their ability to endure suffering for some reason. Chris, if you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. <laughs> well, that, oh, wait, no, no, that, that, came, that came after Christianity, right? That's just, that's like Tolkien. That's like I'm 100% certain that that one <laughs> <laughs> would get classified as being, the, yeah, yeah just, retelling of the yeah. resurrection myth. But you can find things before that. I'm aware of examples from Buddhist and East Asian traditions which do it. But there's also, there's a figure called Orpheus in Greek mythology. And apparently there was a cult based around him. And that was a guy who was apparently like very good at playing music and whatnot. That doesn't matter, right? But went to the underworld to try and re retrieve his wife who died. And tragically, he, he almost got her out, uh, but he was told like not to look back at her the whole journey back. And at the end, he looks back and she dies. And then he ends up being dismembered by followers of Dionysus, right, who tore him apart. So it's a gruesome death. So he didn't succeed. He did not save his wife and he was tore apart. And uh, apparently his hand, and his head and his lyre continued to make nice music after he died, right? But he became a figure of a mystery cult, like, you know, with devotional practices towards him and ascetic, encouraging ascetic uh, practices and, and so on. And that's just one example, right? There are plenty others. If you look through all traditions, you can find many figures who are kind of martyrs. I've got quite a few of them in front of me, but I won't necessarily list them off. <laughs> Give me one. Give me one. One would be Osiris in, in Egypt, right? So so Egypt obviously had at this um, sort of ancient Egypt has had this spiritual notions partly because of the flooding of the Nile about death and rebirth and this sort of thing it was very important to them and Osiris was murdered and dismembered by his brother and then resurrected by his wife Isis so these sort of deep existential notions of death and resurrection and rebirth and rebirth and so on, uh, are you know pretty common themes and I mean I under, I, th I think Tom Holland is right that it was challenging for the Roman or even the general sort of classical kind of Greekish kind of kind of world to accept this Christ who's kind of like a like a weak ass beater. Because they like their gods, you know, strutting around, blowing things Heroic up. Heroic and <laughs> Yeah. So I get that argument as well, that like a lot of these figures and myths are you could draw a parallel with Prometheus, right? But that was a Prometheus was a Titan, I think. But but someone again that was like punished to have his liver eaten out every day for giving humanity fire, right? So suffering for humanity, but a titan, right? However, even within Christianity's own theology, this is one of the topics which, you know, I remember, Matt, from being raised Catholic, that there is a bit of an, a debate here because, sure, Jesus is a, a man or God incarnated as a man who suffers death and you know, is buried and the third day rose again, according to scriptures, blah, 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 blah. But the fact is, he's also the son of God. You know, he defeated death, was resurrected. Now he sits at the right hand of God and rules eternally in heaven to judge, you know, the yeah. good and the... So like, yes, he was a carpenter's son, but he's also the most divine, all-conquering, eternal ruling deity of heaven. So yeah. he's not entirely a meek unpossessing person and you know the meek shall inherit the earth and all that but you do still get in most traditions like including for example in Taoism in in China you do have that the Tao is arguing you know that there is a a correct way to live in accordance with nature that includes acceptance of the way that things are now maybe you're destined to be a ruler 
or maybe you're destined to be a pauper. But in lots of those stories, it is, you know, the sage and the renunciate who is presented as the wise person over the rich person or the powerful general. Now, also, they are giving advice to like kings and whatnot, how to rule. But but in the same way, Christianity was also about, you know, the divine rule of kings and spreading the rule of God and the inquisition and the conquistadors and whatnot. So it feels like when you have a tradition which is so long standing and has so many different threads and especially around the founder being a deity and also human, right? This is a very common concept, by the way, in religion that the the figure is an ambiguous character, right? Like in between divinity and humanity. It's not alone to Christianity. Yeah, it just feels like focusing solely on the meek message feels a little bit like having your cake and eating it because then you when you're talking about the excesses and the the kind of domineering political aspects of christianity that you're saying well but that was a little bit always in tension with the message about like a universal uh, savior for all of mankind that doesn't prioritize the strong and the powerful yeah and you know and he's talking about christianity not just as like like the ancient teachings of Christ, but also kind of how it evolved over, over time. And one of the ways in which it did evolve is it became Romanized, right? Mm. Just like, you know, Christianity influenced the Roman world, the Roman world influenced Christianity and it became much more hierarchical and said it said a lot of things about staying in your place and so on. And that kind of stuff was pretty important in the medieval conceptualizations of Christianity, right? And that and that kind of, oh, you'll inherit the earth, you can read that as, this is how the Marxists read it, this is the opiate, right? This will this will keep people content with, with their lot in life and stop them from having revolutions. So as, as well as that, there's just major issues with his thesis that Christianity is kind of the root of a, of a concern with individual belief and individual conscience, right? Yeah, I initially found that kind of compelling <laughs> when, I, when I heard it on the podcast. But then when I thought about it more, I thought, hang on, like in the ancient world bef- before Christ mm. came along, that that philosophical tradition of skepticism and... Stoics. Yeah, Stoics. Yeah, p- perfect example. And, and Stoics also believe not just in sort of that sort of individual sort of conscience and stuff like that, but also in, you know, universal human dignity, right? Mm. So, you know, so it, it sort of strikes them out in two ways. So there was that long tradition, like, you know, what Socrates, you know, famously drank hemlock, right? Because of, you know, individual conscience and so on. So it's it's not like these things weren't valorized before. I would also add to that, that like Buddhism and a lot of the, just in general, the Vedic and Sramana movements, there was a lot of consideration about what we would now call cognition, but like thoughts and thinking and, you know, processes of reflection. And I am all in the pains to emphasize that it was not exactly the way it's presented in Western Buddhism, you know, a pure science of the mind. There was a lot of metaphysics like in there as well, but it in many of those traditions, it was focused on individual level thought processes and reflections and introspective looking into the mind. And the same thing existed in Taoism and, you know, I'm sure mystery cults all over the world. Yeah. And I look, I, I'm not, I don't know much about comparative <laughs> religion, right? But uh, in classical India, there was this uh, Kavaka or Savaka school, which promoted apparently a, med- a materialist and skeptical philosophy. And in the Islamic world, there were, there were free thinkers that did sort of similar things. So, you know, so the correspondences he makes, they, they initially are, you know, at least slightly compelling. But then you stop and thinking, well, hang on. I also see correspondences to things that happened before Christianity came along. I also see correspondences to other traditions that we know have no connection to Christianity. So clearly... It's not a necessary ingredient. These things could just be co-occurring. Um, and even if they are cross-fertilizing to some degree, like some yeah. Christian ideas cross-fertilizing with some secular philosophical ones or whatever, then it do- none of it establishes that Christianity is the instrumental causal factor. It's just saying that it's part of the mix. I still find it relatively persuasive about the particular emphasis placed, perhaps in the Abrahamic traditions 
um, more broadly, not just Christianity or Protestant Christianity, about the importance of personal belief. And actually, I would say, you know, linking that specifically to like Protestantism and and maybe Islam as well. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know Islamic theology very well, but my impression is that it matters if you actually believe or, you know, you just go through the motions. But, But the point is, I do think there is something that can be said about if you look at modern conceptions of secularism and rejection of religion in the West, it's very focused around a Abrahamic Christian kind of conception of religion. And I think he makes a good case that other people have made that in other societies, that distinction was not as obviously apparent because, you know, the the way that the societies were organized was just more things being mixed in together. Mm -hmm. And I buy that, but I, like you said, I think when you look back at history, like you can find in in Japan and in China, various laws where they distinguish between the laws of the Buddha and the monks and the laws of, you know, the secular and the king. They don't call it the secular. They talk about, you know, rulers and the peasants and all that kind of thing. But there's a division, right? Like an implied division. Yeah. Yeah, And Mm. various scholars have argued about the extent to which that was there. But the point is that wasn't a division whatever it was that came from a Christian perspective. So it's not like it's a completely alien concept. So I think, you know, there are parts about his thesis that are interesting. And it's, you know, one of the positive receptions to the book is like it's thought provoking. Yeah. And books that do this, that present like such a strong thesis, Jared Diamond did it with geography or or guns, Mm -hmm. germs and steel, right? It's in the book title. But whenever they do this, it does provoke because people are like oh that's very interesting these things clearly do have a big impact but then other people say well hold on there was a lot of other stuff going on that you know that doesn't account for and i see that as like the positive aspect but i i feel what you were talking about at the start with the parallels with jordan peterson and stuff that the book also is essentially like an apologist's dream or christian's dream because it it is saying you know, you are right, everything in the West, which is good or which can be seen as, you know, promoting human flourishing, it is fundamentally Christian. And all those (laughs) alternative philosophies, they're just really offshoots responding to Christianity. So you can't take a lot of credit for universal human rights or even secularism. Yeah, it is a simplistic kind of reading of the book. It may be not one that Tom Holland would endorse, but it's also it's kind of one that it encourages. It encourages it can yeah. Uh, and, but the reason I thought of um, Jordan Peterson actually is because of course while he's popular amongst people who who want um, Christian apology, he also is criticised by more serious Christians, right? Because he's kind of a cultural Christian, right? This kind he's kind of a metaphysical, yeah. abstracted, metaphorical, Christian. yeah, and. Tom Holland, some of the reviews I read were, were by you know, Christian publications and, and they really didn't like the fact, <laughs> like, like they noticed very quickly, just like they noticed with Jordan Peterson, that hang on, he's talking about Christianity as a, like a cult, a set of cultural idea. ideas. Yeah, mm. rather, and you're completely ignoring the fact that the Christ died and rose from the dead and God's real and things like that. So no, I find that kind of um, ironic. But um, look, my, my more general issue with the thesis, because I do agree with you, like I think, I think at the margins there is truth in what he's saying, right? I, I think, yeah. I think there, can, there can be legitimate connections made. He just sort of overstates the uniqueness and the indispensability of Christianity yeah. in driving that stuff. I tend to see it more like Christianity, just like any other religion, is often an expression, like a, the- a theological and an institutional expression of some, you know, underlying cultural ideas that are going on. So my sort of understanding of religions is is kind of psychological or even evolutionary, I suppose, which is that people are social primates. We need mm. to cooperate a lot to get along. We need to cooperate even more than is typical for our for our evolutionary background once you know, technology and civilization comes along because we're living in yeah. larger and larger groups and things get very complicated. And there's going to be a strong tendency for um, cultural ideas to arise, which which say, 
you know, you, you should cooperate better. You should be like pro-social things are good, right? Yeah. Um, you know, don't cheat, don't lie. Don't lie. Don't cover thy neighbor's ass and things like that, right? Because <laughs> these things are helpful for a culture to to prosper, right? So, yeah. so you tend to see those ideas. You know, you see them in Christianity, but you see them in all other religions as well, right? There's very few religions which is saying, "Hey, go go steal from your neighbor <laughs> and uh, you know, overthrow the king and uh, just you know run around being a being a total individualist and selfish." Right. That's that's generally not what religions advise. So so those pro social ideas, which are the things that Tom Holland tends to celebrate, he attributes them all to Christianity, but they're kind of ubiquitous, right? Well, um, Christianity can be an expression of yes. that psychological tendency or, you know, cultural evolution tendency, such that, you know, if you think about the thought experiment where let's say, you know, set aside the, the actual divine nature of Jesus or whatever you believe about that. Just imagine an alternative world where Christianity didn't exist. There was no Jesus figure, but humanity existed for the same amount of time. So Tom Howland's view, I think, would be, well, we would be living in a very, very different world then, especially in the West. Like, even if you had all the other traditions, if you didn't have Christianity, the world would look very different. And I, I'm not so convinced. I feel like you would have other religious traditions that emerged, uh, you know, could be Mephandra, could be Orpheism, right? whatever it is, that yep. occupy a similar niche. And, and in the same way, traditions end up branching out into all different aspects, having different sects that advocate different things. And yeah, I'm not so sure that having a sacrificial figure as the divinity and arguing that people that are in lower social positions also deserve respect and, and may, you know, be rewarded in the world to come is such a unique message. Because, like, it, again, there's a tradition in, in Buddhism, in Mahayana Buddhism, which is talking about bodhisattvas who promise they already reached enlightenment, Matt. They're, you know, they, they can go off, but they chose not to. Like, they chose not to enter Nirvana and, like, kind of, you know, access the wheel of samsara in order to bring all other living beings to this enlightenment, right? Because of their compassion. And they also argue that if you live a good life and you're compassionate and you're kind or whatever, in the Pure Land version, your best bet is to be reborn into a better world where you can then study, you know, the more refined version of the Dharma and, and you'll go and reach enlightenment easier. But that is a doctrine which is, again, saying be compassionate, be kind in this lifetime, right? Even if you're suffering or whatnot, your, your life has meaning and that there are these beings of pure compassion that are out there who, you know, give up the ultimate reward in order to save humanity and save even more than that, save all sentient beings. So I just feel like, okay, well, that seems like it could fulfill a lot of the things that you are attributing that are only possible in a kind of Christian theology space. And yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing where I just feel like if you know a lot of comparative religion that you wouldn't make that leap. But the thing is Tom Holland he does know, presumably, a whole bunch. Of, I think he's written books about Islam and he's written about, you know, ancient Rome and whatnot. So he must also know about all these other traditions and cults or whatever. But yet he still feels that the, the Christian thing is particularly unique because of the centrality of these features or whatever. And I just don't have that same confidence yeah i don't either yeah so i guess I'm, I'm trying to think of the things that i found more convincing or i don't know the things which feel right <laughs> it's just a pretty weak a weak kind of way to approach it there's one thing that i would i would emphasize that just before it goes out of my head that i think is good is like whenever he's talking about creationism or the opposition to heliocentrism or this kind of thing right he highlights i think correctly that there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a single Christian response to it. There was different sects arguing different things. And the figures who have in history been presented as like, you know, that they are avatars of science or whatever, that they're actually more complicated than that. In the same way 
that the reaction to the discovery of dinosaurs, you can in some ways credit it to what's the word for it, where like the pastors want to go and discover natural law, right? And and the beauty of biology, like Darwin kind of, you know, going out to look at nature as God's creation. So like, I think he does a good job of making it clear that the history is complex and that there are always these kind of competing factions and views. And it's too simplistic to always ascribe a kind of Marxist perspective about religion, that it's always retarding social progress and and like kind of telling people just to be content with life and not think about things too, too much. I thought that was good, that, you know, that is what good history and good writing about topics do is make it clear that the topic is complex and some of the simplified cultural understandings are too simplistic, even yeah. though he is ultimately arguing a rather simplified for, model. For an overarching <laughs> yeah, sort of yeah. thing, yeah. No, no, I agree. And, and like, while I think that the general story is one of, you know, intermixing of ideas and um, cross-fertilization of ideas, and you can't really point to any one particular monocausal thing that was instrumental for a whole bunch of stuff. And I think to a large degree, Christianity is a reflection, just like all religions are a reflection of the cultures Mm. that they're embedded in. Yes, they contribute to the evolution of that culture in the various ways, but, you know, it's just because it's part of the mix, you know, it's a, of course, it's a big, religions are often a big institution in, in the societies in which they exist with a lot of people involved. So of course, the framing and the, the ways in which people think about things, it's going to be, it's going to be influenced. And, you know, I can, I can think of specific examples where, like, let's say in the West, um, you know, I think there's been a, a fair bit of reluctance like sort of instinctive reluctance in for, in people to actually concede that other species, you know, might be able to think, might be able to have, might be able to feel that kind of thing. There has been Emotional a tendency to kind of, and so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, that that's right. We do have a conceptual dichotomy between people, the golden barrier. Yeah, that's right, and and all the other living things on Earth, right? And um, you know, and this has been reflected in you know tendencies to you know exploit the environment and you know it, environmental that has struggled a bit in the popular acceptance because of that. And I think, you know, you could point to Christianity, which does have that strong distinction between, you know, God created us and he created all this we stuff. We have dominion over the we animals. Have, we have dominion, yeah. exactly. So, you know, I think, I, think, I think there's probably an instrumental role there. That's just a very specific example. But so I think at the margins, you can actually point to religion and say, yes, this religion has, influ- has influenced a cultural mindset in this direction a bit. And you could point to a bunch of specific things, but I, like you, I kind of reject the thesis, which is this all-encompassing, overarching, instrumental. Monocausal. Monocausal. Yeah. Yeah. And it is not to say, you know, you give the example about the potential, like, negative implication for environmentalism from Christianity. But I think some of the connections he draws to conceptions in universal human rights and, and Christian perceptions of human dignity, those are more clearly drawn connections. You know, you can make, like, whenever you're talking about the Quakers and the opposition to the slave trade, right? And the fact that this was initially kind of a fringe position, but it came to be more widely accepted, right? Like, there are obvious direct connections there from the motivations in in religion. So it isn't always that it goes in the direction of you know, a negative outcome. I know you no, weren't no. saying that, but I'm just no, making, no. there's no, there's no objection to me from that or to, to the notion that there are elements of secularism, particularly in the West that mm-hmm. are related to religious traditions. I think that's an interesting perspective and one that there's certainly some validity to, but it's just, yeah. yeah, I think it's in general, this book rubbed us both the wrong way by being so strident in the way that it was presenting. And in some respect, I really like Tom Holland from the podcast. I liked the provocativeness of the thesis that he suggested. And I went into the book with a pretty positive, you know, mindset that I'd like to hear a good case made for this. And he did make a strong case, but I don't know that I would call it like a particularly persuasive good one. So that was the bit that was like a bit disappointed. Like I find it afterwards, it kind of sullied a little bit my perspective of how Tom Holland interprets history. Yeah. If if yeah. that does factor in, you know, more broader than just this provocative book. And I, I think it probably does <laughs> from the, <laughs> the, the general yeah. thing. But yeah. 
Yeah, like you, my response was the same. I mean, I enjoyed aspects of it. It's not generally the kind of history book I like. I don't like a history book, one with an overarching kind of grand mm. kind of thesis. I, I'd like ones that just that go through the details of what happened because for me, history is just in <laughs> like, you know, all of the little details. I've, I've really enjoyed certain podcasts. I'm going to mention a podcast. I'm going to sell it just what? as a contrast to the Tom Holland uh-huh. style, which is uh, when diplomacy fails. And he does the blow by blow, you know, this is what happens this happened with then, this then. person. The, it, he's citing the raw documents and gives you all of the details of the narrative. Yes, he, he gives his own commentary about stuff and does, you know, do some little bit of interpretation, but mostly is like letting the reader, like allowing you to draw your own narrative or um, your, your own conclusions from these events that happened. I like the fact that it was a, a thought provoking thing. And, you know, it, it, it is interesting to think about, say, the influence of Christian thought on, say, the development of social welfare you know like it's yeah, true yeah, I, I, yeah. I knew before I read this book I don't think he even mentioned this as one of his examples but you know the kind of very early beginnings of of actual yeah. you know providing help to the poor right was yeah, kind yeah. of like a upper middle class hobby especially among wealthy women you know what I mean yeah. who were sort of expressing their Christian values by doing so and eventually you could well argue that that sort of thing eventually became systematized in terms of being a function being done by government I don't mind kind of admitting that it's kind of hard to imagine Marxism arising in say like a Roman <laughs> an ancient Roman context, right? And you know, so I can kind of well, wasn't see how... there slave revolts and stuff? And, and yeah, Rome but I don't were... think they had a theory. That... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they didn't have a dialectical theory, Chris, about Caesar. Okay, and... you know, you could see that some of the some of the rationales there, you know, and influence. It's just that because Christianity is part of the mix, you can't really point to it. It being pure, like they're they're referencing cultural ideas that are certainly there yeah. in nineteenth century Europe, and Christianity is part of the mix. But you just can't sort of point, say, you know, make that direct connection. You know, another controversial sort of thing that he proposes is that sort of modern day wokeness. Oh, is a is a variation a, of Christianity? Was it? Yeah, like, basically a sublimation, a sublimation yeah. of of Christian impulses and um you know you can <laughs> there are parallel but i mean like don't feel special because he also ascribed marxism secularism <laughs> yeah you're not special <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, everything is christianity so don't worry yeah, like people <laughs> just re, rebadged, but yeah that does come up at the end and as religion wanes people replace it with things which are expressing like still expressing religiosity yeah. right that's the kind of thesis but one last argument that i'll mention Matt, which i find unconvincing and which i i think illustrates like the less appealing parts of the book is like in the epilogue he's talking about his godmother and how nice she was for him and his relationship with her and that's fine i'm not saying that's the least appealing thing but he's talking about how he as a child didn't have a strong appreciation for the role of Christianity, even though it was important in her life. And he was more interested in dinosaurs, right? And he, he had this thought about dinosaurs being around for millions of years and then, you know, meteorites hitting. And, you know, you could also say bacteria being around billions of years and whatnot. Like, it doesn't fit very well with the Christian narrative about humanity being the, the central feature of the, the universe and, and thing, right? And then... He kind of leaps, not directly, he doesn't spell it out so clearly, but he says, you know, but then we later find out that dinosaurs are still around, like, because birds are, you know, descended from dinosaurs, a particular lineage. And so, in a way, they're still with us. And when you think about, you know, the continuity of life and all these kind of things and God as a potential, you know, source under it or... And the connection to me didn't seem immediately clear, but also it's not a really good answer to that because one, imagine that didn't happen, that the birds were not like the, you know, none of the dinosaurs preserved, just mammals. So would that then mean that, you know, it actually was a convincing argument against, and still, you still have the issue of billions of years of like, you know, Diff- yep. single-celled life and uh, bacteria and then oh, big yeah, lizards well, and 
Yeah, all yeah, kinds just all of, the monsters, <laughs> all the monsters, all, all kinds of fascinating biology um, ecosystems. You know, impressive, amazing stuff that that was happening for hundreds of millions of years, long before humans and any need it for came on God the came scene. on the scene. Yeah, right. It is a problem, right? So, I mean, <laughs> you, you reminded me of that, Chris, before, and I said it was just very funny because you know, childhood. Tom Holland was right, <laughs> like he was right. But then, but then, adult Tom Holland thought about it too much, and, and he liked and church and bells and, and he recognized, it. yeah, that this godmother, you know, her faith mattered a lot to her, and you know, give her sustenance. And and I like that's all fine. That's all fine. I'm not saying you have to take you know a, a secular atheistic position, but it's just that particular argument. It's not dismissed by the fact that dinosaurs are related to birds or that no, somebody by substance, you know, like even if it still was a very core component and was even a part of the motivation of why we know about dinosaurs, that wouldn't defeat the core argument that underpins that. So that was that was just the thing where I could see that there are people who would read that and then find, ah yeah. You know, that, yep. it, you know, find it appealing in the same way, like Jordan Peterson reading this book would just be constantly affirmed he, in his perspective. <laughs> yeah, he and would. He'd be yeah, loving it. He'd like be loving that's, it. Yeah. that's the yeah. issue. But, you know, it's an interesting book. I've heard from other people that it's Tom Holland's weakest book, that his other right. books yeah. are better well, and less. Well, you and I certainly enjoy the podcast more than we um, enjoyed the book. Yeah, and, yeah. Podcast but, you know, is still good. But, you know, I'll make some conciliatory final statements too, which is that uh, even though I basically fundamentally disagree <laughs> with the central thesis, <laughs> I, I can see it, you know, a little bit around the margins. And, I, you know, it, it was still an, an enjoyable read. And I liked that it was, you know, thought-provoking yeah. and, um, yeah. and, and, and challenging. You know, I'm, I'm glad I read it. It was okay. Onwards and upwards. Our next mm. book, if you have suggestions, put them on a postcard and <laughs> send mm. them in. We'll, we'll look. We've had immune... From Philip Detmer, which was a big hit. We've had Dominion, which yeah. <laughs> received less positively, but still interesting. So where do we go from here? The world's our oyster. So yep. let's see. Yep. Send us your mail um, and your suggestions. Yep. Chris, Chris's right. mind needs to be expanded and we're all here to help. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, maybe we should look at a book which argues that Buddhism is the most important thing that ever <laughs> happened in the history of ideas. Uh, Buddhist exceptionalist book. But um, yeah, anyway. All right. Well, Matt, there's that dominion decoded from the point of view of two secular atheists rejecting their fundamental Christian. This, yep. uh, that's yep. it. It's all just yep. psychological projection yep. and defense mechanisms, really. Yep. So, if if this goes on YouTube, it'll be Matt and Chris destroy, eviscerate. <laughs> yeah, Tom <laughs> Holland. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's it. Well, let's see. Any case, thank you, Matt, and you, I will see you again. Goodbye. God bless. <laughs>